Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I think we have just about all the board members uh, who are joining. Um, Mike Scarra, if you could also look for Jerry Cristinino. Jerry um, said he couldn't get on. If you could just look for him as well, that'd be great. Welcome everybody. Could I have a motion to return to the public session? moved. Okay, we are back in the public session. Can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, to God, invisible, liberty, and justice for all. And if I could ask all the board members uh, to go on mute, unless you're speaking during the meetings. Good evening. It's been three weeks since our last Board of Ed meeting. And sadly, since that time, we've all borne witness to how this insidious COVID-19 virus is impacting our families, our communities, and our very way of life. What we're facing is daunting, but I'm heartened by the moments of triumph and everyday acts of courage, humanity, and love. We're equally inspired by the continued dedication, commitment, and creativity I hear about in our, vir in our virtual classrooms. Although these are trying times for us all, I remain optimistic that our community and our greater society will thrive once again. There are countless people on the front lines fighting this battle each and every day. They include our incredibly courageous doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals, our first responders like the police, the fire, and the rescue squad, along with so many others, including postal employees, supermarket associates, restaurant workers, gas station attendants, long haul truckers, warehouse workers, and so many more. All of you deserve our thanks, our gratitude, and our appreciation for the courage you have to get up and do the jobs that you do every day. Today marks the end of week six of our remote learning. By all indications, our students are engaging with their teachers and support staff in ways none of us would have ever envisioned a short two months ago. Members of our school community are working together to make remote learning progress as best as we can. There continue to be great examples of this. Our National Honor Society is providing one-on-one -on -one remote tutoring. Elementary school artists are creating special thank you notes for first responders. Our GL phys ed teachers are creating or have created a video to connect with their students. Special ed teachers in Paris paying home visits to their students. Some were facing even greater challenges with the remote learning. Color a smile, where students are drawing pictures for senior citizens and troops overseas. Our school district's 3D printers are being used to make face masks for healthcare professionals and seniors. Our Berkeley Heights. Uh, Berkeley Heights continues to demonstrate our togetherness as a community. Our frontline appreciation group, also known as FLAG, continues to deliver meals in places like Overlook Hospital, Summit Medical Group, and the Testing Center in Union. They have raised over $45,000 and delivered 1,965 meals, a truly amazing accomplishment. Our Neighbors Helping Neighbors initiative, where anyone who needs assistance can get it by placing a simple call. A new group, Business Aid Berkeley Heights, a community fund to provide emergency assistance grants to our town small business who are facing COVID-19 hardships, most who didn't receive any federal aid. Chalk messages written outside our healthcare facilities that say, quote, heroes work here. Additionally, there's very timely and useful information updated daily on the township's website, thanks to our mayor, Angie Devaney, Township Administrator Liza Vienna, along with Pam, ya Pam Yoss and the Communications Committee for their daily updates on healthcare information and both federal and state information. Finally, I'd like to make a special call out to our very own Mike Scarra, our technology coordinator. On Sunday morning of this week, he completed the Backyard 50K, where he ran 31 miles to raise vital funds for this flag group, as well as the Student Movement Against Cancer Relay for Life team. 
Mike personally raised over $3,000 in one day for these two organizations. More important, Mike demonstrated firsthand what it takes to give back to the community where he works, to pay it forward to the others who need. Thanks, Mike, you're a great example of how in times of need, we're there for one another. In closing, during this difficult time, we are all asking for kindness, for patience, and for thoughtfulness for each other. Try to shop local if possible, and simply look out for one another. I would encourage everyone to keep family, friends, and colleagues safe. And at the same time, I want to celebrate and encourage continuing the great positive spirit we have seen, rallying resources, supporting small businesses, and encouraging each other. Be well and stay safe. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, part of the agenda. Could I have a motion to accept the minutes from our previous meeting on April 2nd? Motion to accept. Second. Okay. All, in favor, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, those those are part of the official record. I, I have a question. When when I mute, I can't unmute myself again without without inter intervention from Mike. Is that happening to everybody? Yes. 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 Can we make it so that we have control over muting and unmuting? I have done so, that, Mr. Cassano. So, Mike, Mike Scarra, can you make sure, Mike Scarra, can you I, make sure that all of the panelists have the ability to unmute themselves? Yes, sir. They should be able to do that now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, correspondence, Donna. Uh, there's two pieces of correspondence. Uh, we received an email from Mrs. Kostrowski regarding the survey and an email from Mr. Martinez regarding COVID-19. Great, thanks, Donna. Um, let's, move, let's move on to the report of the superintendent. Dr. Varley? Do you want to do the student representatives first or you want me to go? I want, I want you to go. Okay, all right, perfect. Um, we entered week six of remote learning this week, and I know I have stated how many times, I, so many times that I'm very proud of the staff and students, but they are really going above and beyond, and I could not be prouder. You may know that the New Jersey Bill A3904 has been passed. It is the bill that allows schools to use remote learning to meet the 180 day requirement at any time that we are at a school for three consecutive days. The Commissioner of Education will approve the superintendent's submitted plan, and we will revisit the opening of schools on May 15th. We know that our staff is working very hard, but there are times when people can slip through the cracks of gratitude. Andrew Sai is working behind the scenes to make sure that our students and staff have the technology that they need. He even facilitated an iPad drop-off to one of our deaf and hard of hearing students in Jersey City, along with Kevin Raffetto. So I wanna thank both of them for going above and beyond to uh, make sure our students have what they need. Chrissy Figueroa has been making and delivering lunches for students who qualify for free and reduced lunches. She delivers the meals twice a week with five days worth of food in the delivery. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for your hard work. You may not also know it, but Joe Voorhees, our GL video production teacher, is an EMT. He put together a video in support of the healthcare workers in Union County. I will share the link of the video in my newsletter tomorrow. It will bring tears to your eyes. Thank you, Joe. A huge thank you also goes out to Drew Ziobro for picking up all the 3D printers and delivering them to people who wanted to make plastic shields for our healthcare workers. He is also picking up some of our sewing machines at GL that are no longer in use for a community member to make cloth masks for our senior citizens. Our AP US history students Zoomed with Mr. Malinowski, our congressman. They had a lot of questions regarding the CARES Act, and I'm so proud to be involved with such bright students. They had some really tough questions. Thank you, Mr. Bolger and Mr. Hopkins for getting it all set up. Six weeks is a very long time to be at home with your children while doing your full-time job and also taking care of a home. 
I applaud you for being so flexible and positive. My mission in education has always been to do everything I can to make a child's experience in education the best it possibly can be. I know you all have questions regarding prom, graduation, field day, promotion ceremonies, summer school, extended school year, et cetera, et cetera. Know that we are working hard to make a plan B. It is best for children to be in their classroom for true academic gains, to receive their therapies, and to interact with their classmates. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to be in our buildings until the governor deems it safe to be back in large crowds. You're going to hear, be hearing a lot more about the above activities that students have anticipated for so very long. While it may not be done in the way they're expecting or how they were expecting, something will happen. We want to keep our traditions alive, so please be patient with us as we try to make decisions. I know Mr. Geiger and Mr. Nixon have reached out for your input and the district truly values your opinion. There have also been a great deal of questions about grading. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McKinney and let him talk about grading um, since that is his area. So I'll turn it over to you, Scott. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we continue to receive such positive feedback for our teachers and all the work they're doing during this difficult time. I'm so impressed with how quickly our teachers and students are adapting and improving day to day and week to week in this new setting. As the duration of remote learning has been extended, we have been working behind the scenes over the past two weeks with our supervisors, principals, and teachers to establish a consistent message for the delivery of curriculum and instruction, as well as expectations and guidelines for assessment and grading. Beyond sharing this information here this evening, we're also communicating this information to our families through the principals and teachers using their established lines of communication. Just as a very quick and brief general summary, uh, what we've done behind the scenes is create grade level and content area goals and targets uh, for making progress through the district curriculum as we uh, progress under the current constraints of remote learning. Um, we, the goal is to establish consistency across the different uh, grade levels and classrooms and different teachers that are teaching the same subject areas. A couple key understandings that we all have embraced at this point is that all learning will take more time during this remote learning and we won't be able to cover everything at the same uh, depth or breadth that we would like to or if we were together in our classrooms. While the mode of delivery may differ by teacher, uh, the consistency that we're trying to establish will help us as we move forward and out of remote learning and back into our classrooms as we prepare our students and we make up for the time we miss together. As we are apart and we closed our second trimester or third marking period uh, with students right as we are closing, we enter the last segment of our school year and as we are making progress through our curriculum and making sure that our students are being instructed, it's important that we use assessment in a variety of different formats to provide the students with feedback on their work and measure our progress towards student achievement and the, uh, mastery of our content. Grading for progress reports and report cards will follow what our traditional uh, methods have been. While many districts are having conversations regarding the use of pass-fail for the remote learning period, we did not feel it was in the best interest of our students. There is a, a strong concern among our administrators that it would diminish the quality and the feedback that we provide to our students if we were just in a pass-fail situation. We additionally were concerned that it would have a negative impact on student engagement if they weren't receiving the normal grading and just a pass-fail situation. At the high school level, there's additional concerns for pass-fail as unintended consequences could lead to negatively impacting student GPAs, eligibility, and credit status in some of their courses. And we don't want this short-term issue to become long-term issues that appear on student transcripts. And finally, we believe that keeping the common language that is clearly understood by our students, our parents, and our teachers will be beneficial to everyone as long as we understand that we are working from the premise that we remain flexible and understanding of individual circumstances and challenges that students are having during this time period. 
So for all those reasons, we, we decided that it would be most consistent to remain with our current grading scales um, that we're all quite used to. Um, these, these discussions have uh, taken place at grade level meetings and at department meetings at, at the various dif different levels. And we shared reminders with our teacher teaching staff about flexibility and submission timelines, encouraging students to resubmit assignments that they're struggling with. Um, we encourage the teachers to remember that we want to be cognizant of the length of assignments, that we're not overwhelming our students with too much work. We are requiring the teachers collaborate with their co-teachers and the child study team to make sure that we're making every effort to um, meet the accommodations that are contained within IEP plans and 504 plans. And, consort, and, and then finally, we wanna remain consistent with our normal expectations that teachers are providing feedback to students on a regular, timely, and consistent basis. So even though we're apart, you know, good teaching is good teaching, and we wanna make sure that this uh, is continuing. Um, so the final piece of the puzzle uh, is, and the question that is looming and is still out there are final exams. We have had numerous discussions on this over the past two weeks, and, and those discussions are ongoing. We anticipate, well, we know that if we are to have final exams in any format, they would need to be modified to match the instruction that is taking place. Uh, but more information will be communicated in the very near future as we come up with a, a plan if remote learning were to extend through the end of the year. Great, uh, Scott, thank Thanks, you. Scott. Um, Melissa, before we move on to the next, let me just make sure that um, everybody uh, who's attending the meeting will just explain what's going to happen next for the rest of your report. So there are three topics that we're going to discuss uh, next. The first one is safety and security, which Melissa will talk about in a second. The second one is a conversation about our budget. And the third one is a conversation about, uh, about our referendum. Uh, we will talk all three of those topics. Uh, when we got to, when we get to the public, uh, the citizens hearing portion of our meeting, uh, anybody of course can ask a question about any of those topics that we've covered or any other uh, topic uh, within the district. If there'll be one uh, citizens hearing. It will be at the conclusion of um, of those three topics, and after we hear from our students, uh, and then that's when the public um, the citizens hearing will be. Um, Melissa, I'll give it to you to, uh, to introduce the safety and security topic. So um, we had this presentation planned for March and we had to move it due to COVID-19. So we are bringing it back with Ms. Oliveira. She, is go she has um, our chief, uh, John De Pasquale, Chris Afanito, and Ed Gaffney with her to discuss safety and security within our district. So Tara, I will let you take it away. Hello everyone, good evening. I see that Mike uh, got rid of my camera, probably noticing I'm hiding in my car from my three-year-old. Uh, so I am going to share my screen with you now. I'm glad uh, it wasn't that you're driving, by the way. No, not driving, just hiding from a three-year-old at bedtime. <laughs> so let me just share my screen here for you and we will get started. Mike, it's actually not allowing me to share. Right now, Ms. Oliver. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So, as I said, good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I know this is a crazy time, um, but you know we wanted to make sure that we're presenting some information that we have about district safety and security with you this evening. As said earlier, my name is Tara Oliveira. I'm assistant principal at Governor Livingston High School, and tonight I'm going to be speaking with you in my role as Dif district safety and security specialist. This evening, we're going to discuss several topics as they pertain to all students in the Berkeley Heights School District, and you can see them listed here. As you see, there are various school security drills that are required by New Jersey law. They're required either monthly, such as a fire drill, or at two different times over the course of the school year. 
Uh, these include the lockdown drill, active shooter drills, non-fire evacuation drills, and bomb threat drills. These required drills can be classified into two different categories. The first two that are listed here. So we have lockdown and active shooter, and then the emergency evacuation, which is either non-threat or bomb. As you look at these descriptions, it's important to note that our goal is to minimize risk and get staff, students, and visitors to secure locations within classrooms or to properly evacuate the location and to ensure the safety of all of our students, staff, and visitors. What I'd like you to do is recognize the third category that's here, though, as well, shelter in place. It's not a required drill, so it wasn't on the previous slide, but it is often used in our schools. When there is a shelter in place, it's generally used to clear the hallways so that we can deal with a situation that's occurring, uh, be it a medical situation or some other reason that we just need to make sure the halls are clear so that we can handle what's going on. As we continuously work to reflect upon and improve our practices, the District Crisis Planning Committee has been discussing several different policy changes. Some of them are already in practice, such as the first one that we announced the word drill for the drills. And then there's some that are newly identified, uh, such as alerting parents that a drill took place on a specific day before the end of the day. In feedback that we've received from the community, allowing students time to debrief with teachers and classmates, and then again at home with parents if wanted, is really going to help support student well-being. School security drill law states that all full-time employees have to be provided with training on school safety and security, which includes instruction on school security drills, and also specifies that teaching staff members need to be provided with training within 60 days of their start of their employment. So staff members and students are trained annually on our drill processes and procedures. In addition, the crisis planning team, which is composed of administrators, law enforcement, uh, school psychologists, directors, food service personnel, transportation, uh, it goes on and on to name a few. We meet to address new protocols and to implement uh, and to review implementation of best practices so we can include them in our crisis response manual that we update yearly. It's important for me to emphasize, sorry about that. It's important to emphasize that all these trainings and meetings are held in coordination with the Berkeley Heights Police Department. And they are in fact active members of the security drills at all times uh, in all schools. And to revisit some information that has been previously shared, um, some of this as a result of a collaborative grant between the Berkeley Heights Police Department and uh, Berkeley Heights Public Schools, Communication and guidance from the state um, and the Berkeley Heights Police Department led to many of these safety upgrades and updates that are shared on this slide. I want to focus on the last of which, which is the LENS system. It stands for Lockdown Emergency Notification System, LENS. Um, it, they've been infused into our new drill procedures. So if we're put into a lockdown or at the high school, a lockdown and additionally a shelter in place, the LENS system will play an automatic announcement, an automated announcement for those in the building, a lockdown evacuation. It also places a call to 911 and the local police department. It activates LED signboards that shows a message that will tell you outside that schools are in lockdown. There's alerts that go up in the gymnasiums, the auditorium, the cafeteria, um, and other areas. There's strobe lights. Um, there are strobe lights installed on the outside doors and in some loud areas such as the cafeteria and music rooms. As spoken earlier, we appreciate the partnership that we have with the Berkeley Heights and Mountainside Police Departments. And again, we have uh, three gentlemen with us this evening. Uh, listed here are some of the other officers uh, that we are fortunate to work with frequently in order to ensure the safety of our school community. Through the Memorandum of Agreement, Berkeley Heights Public Schools and both Berkeley Heights and Mountainside PD were able to co uh, communicate information and ensure cooperation between law enforcement and education officials in order to protect the students and staff in the education environment. There have been concerns about the disproportionality of how students, school-based arrests and subsequent uh, court involvement can negatively impact a student. And so there have been a lot of revisions to the memorandum of agreement to clarify the difference between mandatory reporting and non-mandatory reporting from a school administrator and what needs to be shared with the police. 
School resource officers are Berkeley Heights and Mountainside police officers that work specifically with our school administrators in order to provide programming, guidance, and feedback in several different avenues. And Chris Afanito is with us if, this evening. He is currently our school, one of our school resource officers. Uh, overall, these individuals have presence in the building and they help to promote a positive relationship between the police officers and the students. Uh, interactions are frequent and always in a positive manner. In Berkeley Heights, we also have two class three officers currently. They are full-time police officers in our school who have police jurisdiction on school property. Uh, these individuals help to support the safety and security in our buildings. They act as first responders if em emergency situations uh, arise. And uh, there's a little chart here on the right. You can see that um, at no time in the past four years, though, has a student been detained or referred to the police department by a class three officer or an SRO. I wanna emphasize that the administrators, although there are police in our buildings, are still the ones that deal with discipline and deal with counseling when necessary. But we find it extremely valuable to have our police officers in the building as immediate responders for many different situations. If there's an incident that obviously requires the police, then at that time we would uh, you know, get the SRO or the class three involved. As discussed earlier uh, throughout this presentation so far, we have many groups that work together to inform our decisions. Um, I do wanna speak briefly about our safety teams. Um, and then I wanna talk about our soon to be implemented social emotional learning framework. Yeah. Our school safety teams, uh, which are guided by uh, New Jersey statute meet on a regular basis to foster a positive climate, uh, they focus on issues such as harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Although parent representatives are not privy to specifics about school security drills, just as they're not to specifics about HIV, they do. Uh, are, they are very much a part of our, our school safety teams. And school safety teams can be used as an avenue for parent representatives to provide feedback regarding drills. There's a parent on a school safety team in every building, and their feedback has been and will continue to be vital as they are the voice of the community. School safety teams have worked very diligently this year. To, they are a vehicle for the social emotional framework that's being adopted in New Jersey schools. Although uh, New Jersey safety teams are mandated as part of the anti-bullying legislation, it's our goal as a district to use this committee to help grow a positive and safe school culture in all areas of our educational process. So as you see here, there are five competencies in the social emotional framework. And I mentioned that our school safety teams are really working on this framework as part of what they're implementing. Over the past two years, guidance counselors and child study team members have been receiving social emotional learning training and utilizing the ways in their practice to infuse social emotional learning district wide. Uh, although it's more than we can cover tonight, and you've heard in prior presentations with Dr. Janosko and her staff, we have been working on SEL training with our teachers uh, as well and providing support to our students in the form of, I'm sure you've seen therapy dogs, lunch groups, yoga, wellness workshops, which actually we held one for parents the other night as well, um, and by supporting the mayor's wellness campaign in our schools. Lessons have been infused into the classroom, we focused on topics such as empathy, as you can see here, um, self-awareness and diversity. And overall, the school community at large has a larger focus on the social emotional well-being of everyone involved. <clears throat> Just some more examples of school safety team activities that students and staff are involved in for you. As I conclude, I do want to note that safety and security really remain a top priority in the entire district. And through our many outlets, we are constantly evaluating, constantly reflecting on our practices and looking at best practices in order to ensure the safety of our students and our staff and all members of our Berkeley Heights public school community. That is what I have for you this evening. And I believe you said we're going to hold questions to the end, correct, Mr. Reinstein? I did say that. Thank you, Tara. Nope. Um, I do want to. I do want to at this time um, allow for the board members uh, to have questions. Sure. So, Mike, if you can take down the, the screen share. Yep, I can do that. And if uh, if a board member has a question, uh, come off of mute and ask a question. If not, 
that's fine. Uh, but does any of the board members have questions for Tara? I'm good, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Tara, the SEL committee, who is that comprised of? I don't know if you want to jump in a little bit on that as well, because I know that's a big part of, um, you know, what you've been working on. But uh, Ashley, Ashley Janosko, who's our, uh, obviously, you know, director of school counseling, uh, has child study team members. There are counselors on it. There are some teachers on the SEL uh, committee. So it's really a, a very diverse group, um, making sure that all stakeholders kind of have a, a say in what's going on and how we can best implement um, what we've been working on. Mr. McKinney, do you have more? No, you nailed the you nailed the group. Dr. Janosko uh, led this committee this year to develop a, a framework and a common language, uh, so that we can train our teachers starting in hopefully in September, uh, with uh, ways in which we can all positively impact school culture and climate, um, so that it is a, a shared responsibility of the entire district. So it's something that's been an ongoing task throughout this year, and we hope to share a final product with the board. Uh, shortly and also uh, initiate some of the training to set us up for positive outcomes next year. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Scott. Any other questions from, from board members? Yes, I have a question. Tara, how, okay. are, how are the parent representatives selected for the school safety teams? And um, are they comfortable with their names being made public so that other parents in the community, if they have questions or suggestions or concerns, they can liaise with those parent representatives to make sure that, you know, their issues are heard. Um, so I don't know the answer to your latter question. I, I feel like I would want to speak with those individuals and make sure that they would be comfortable with that. And that's something that we can talk about um, because we have not in the past shared the names of the parents publicly that are on the school safety teams. Um, that said, how are they selected? There's a variety of different ways. We do have a lot of parent volunteers that do come forward at times. And so we, um, you know, sometimes pull from those pools. Um, we also have people that have shared an interest in school safety or security. Uh, so generally it's been the principals of the principal of the building or the, the communities, um, you know, people that have reached out to them and shared interest. Um, that how it's been selected in the past. There, there re really isn't a formal process at this time. Um, if that's something the board is interested in, definitely something we can talk about um, as we move forward with the piece of uh, giving a little bit more feedback from the community. Well, I'd have to think about this a little bit more, but just from my perspective, I think if they're parent representatives, they should be accessible um, by other parents. So I'll just leave, leave you with that. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions from any other board members on safety and security? Okay, Tara, thank you. And uh, I know um, the Chief, uh, Chief uh, Deep Pasquale is on there and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight yet again the great multi-multi-year partnership we've had uh, with the Chief I know Ed and Chris are on. I know Ernie's not on tonight, but you know um, John's entire team works tirelessly with uh, our administration, with our principals, uh, and not just the people who you saw on the slide who are either the uh, school resource officers, but uh, even the rest of uh, his entire department uh, checks in on the schools on a regular basis. And we wouldn't be where we are in terms of safety and security without the partnership that we have um, with the chief and his entire staff. So uh, I, would, I would be remiss if not, I didn't thank John and the entire staff for everything that they do for our district. Absolutely. Okay, uh, the second topic that we'll cover is a budget uh, update. And I'm gonna ask Chris Riley to just um, have a couple of words about, about the budget uh, before Donna shares uh, an update with the group. Chris? Sure, Doug. So as, as you know, this board approved our preliminary 2021 budget last month on March 12th. And final adoption of our budget is scheduled for May 7th after approval from the county. However, given the current environment, the administration working in collaboration with the finance committee of the board felt that it made sense for us to go back and review our numbers with a mind's eye towards deferring or reducing whatever discretionary spending we could to minimize the impact on our residents. 
This, of course, is, can be challenging as a large majority of our annual operating expenditures relate to salaries and benefits. I believe it's, it's about 84%, but we were able to scrutinize pretty much every discretionary line item. And in addition, I identified certain operating savings due to our buildings being closed for this period of time. As a result, we were able to pro pro propose reducing the preliminary budget by a little over $400,000, which Donna Felisova will walk you through mom momentarily. And none of those reductions affect educational curricula. To wrap up, our original preliminary budget resulted in a net, net tax increase of approximately 2.2% over the prior year. And as a result of these proposed adjustments, we were able to reduce that to a 1.2% increase year over year. So Donna, if you could uh, walk us through uh, the details behind that. Um, thank you, Chris. So in response to concerns regarding the financial impact of this pandemic, we, just, we went back and we looked at our budget. We looked at both the revenues and our expenditures. Uh, when we looked at the revenues, we looked at both pluses and minuses. The first thing that you will see on this chart is it's actually a reduction to the, uh, one of the revenues we were anticipating. When we introduced and rolled out the full day kindergarten program, we were estimating um, 32 children. Uh, the number of students is down from what we originally anticipated. So there is really a negative impact on our tuition for next year, our revenue tuition. But on the positive side, we did look at what we are saving by not having the schools open. Um, and we can put these savings as surplus to help us in next year's budget. So one of the areas of savings is professional development. We will have, um, due to the schools being closed, many of our professional development opportunities have been canceled. That's unfortunate. Um, the schools being closed, we're saving utility costs. So that is electricity. It's mostly electricity. By this time, our heating bills are minimal, but we're saving about $60,000 in electric costs. We are saving transportation costs for the rest of the school year or for these next couple of months, both athletic and co-curricular activities that will not occur. Um, additionally, with the schools being shut down, our supply purchases have slowed to basically nothing. So that's about $15,000. The athletic um, season for the spring, paying officials site supervision is a savings of about $30,000. So all to, um, our biggest savings is in the cost of substitutes. Remote learning requires very few substitutes. So we're saving about $150,000 in substitute costs. This is a revenue adjustment, a positive revenue adjustment of $217,000. Uh, we then looked at our expenses. Uh, one of the things that we're realizing as we're going through this is that there will be additional expenses next year for evaluations of students and services that are probably going to arise due to the shutdown. So we did add that into our budget. We added $30,000 for those additional costs. Um, the change in our anticipated full day kindergarten program will save us about $50,000. We have um, reduced four of our capital projects. Um, we're not making uh, the improvements to the basketball nets, the classroom floor replacement, we're reducing one classroom. We are reducing the scope of our path repairs and our curbing uh, and paving projects. And overall, we did an overall reduction of all district-wide supplies of, of $40,000. So this totals $186,000. Um, so combined, this is a $403,000 change to our budget. 
So this reduction, uh, this affects the tax levy. The tax levy is going down 0.92% uh, from what we originally projected. And the impact on the homeowner was originally $147, $147. It's now $107, so a $40 savings for the um, taxpayer. One thing to note is all of this is based on us getting the state aid and federal aid as anticipated by the state and the federal government. Um, we budgeted, our original state aid figure was $1.9 million, and we're getting approximately $430,000 in federal aid. This was what was told to us in March. And as we all know, the state and federal governments are having their own issues. So we don't know if those numbers will change. Um, this is what we came up with and open for if any board members have questions. Great, thanks, Donna. Uh, so thank you to the uh, Finance Committee who work with the administration. Uh, we were very focused on uh, trying to reduce uh, the tax impact on our uh, on our residents. Uh, we will be approving uh, our final budget at our next meeting on May 7th. Uh, so this is a, a, an interim update for, for the board. If anybody has any questions uh, for either Donna or Chris, we can take them now. If not, we'll also uh, have a discussion at our May 7th meeting where we will do our final approval of the budget. When you came up with the savings numbers as a result of the school shutdown, what date did you assume that the schools reopened? You know, um, these projections actually take us through the end of the school year. Okay, so, this, so these would be the savings if we do not reopen? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions from board members? I just have a comment. Go ahead, Jer. So as a member of the Finance Committee, I really just want to thank Chris for her leadership and Donna and her staff. They've done an excellent job at looking at every expense that we incur. I know it hasn't been easy, <clears throat> and they've continually discussed this and kind of retooled the budget. So I've, I've seen what they've been doing, and I'm very impressed with both of them and Donna's staff. So I just want to thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, any other comments from board members? Okay, uh, Mike, if you could take down the, uh, the slide. Uh, we have one more, one more uh, discussion topic, uh, and it has to do regarding the, uh, the referendum. Uh, and I want to introduce this by, these are obviously my own thoughts, and I'm going to open up uh, comments for the board, but given the unprecedented times that we're in and the uncertainty around people's individual finances, and certainly finances at the state level, uh, I'm going to recommend that we postpone our planned referendum that we had previously scheduled for this September until sometime in 2021 at a date to be determined. To me, it wouldn't feel right this summer to spend time promoting our referendum and then to come back uh, to school in September of this year uh, and ask people to vote when people will still be focused on safety and security and many will still be recovering financially. Uh, if the board uh, is in agreement and agrees to uh, this postponement, there is an impact that I wanna make sure that we discuss, and that is the impact on full day kindergarten. Uh, it's likely that we would have to delay the comprehensive full day kindergarten, September of 2021, which we originally discussed for one year until September of 2022. We simply do not have the funds in our operating budget to make the facility changes that would be required uh, for full day kindergarten. Uh, I fully understand that there are there will be many parents who are counting on full day kindergarten for in September of 21, uh, as well as uh, board members, including myself and others, will also be disappointed if we have to delay uh, full day kindergarten by one year. Um, that said, I don't think in good conscience I could continue uh, to go forward with the uh, with the referendum uh, given these unprecedented times. Uh, so it's my belief. Uh, that we should uh, postpone the referendum from the September timeframe and uh, pick a date sometime in 2021, which will let the facilities committee uh, go back uh, and study. That said, those are my own uh, personal feelings. I would like to open it up to the board uh, and get other people's reactions and thoughts uh, on that. 
So, uh, Doug, um, if it is postponed to September of 2022, the full day kindergarten, uh, would the pilot program then go for two years? Is that what would be proposed? Or how would that work in terms uh, that's of the pilot program? That's something we'll, that's something we'll, that's something we'll have to look at. Obviously, we have the pilot program for one year. We obviously envisioned a one-year one. Uh, that's on our to-do list to understand what our options would be for another year, potentially another year for the pilot. That's something we'd have to look at. Uh, we don't know that answer right now, but it's it's uh, A1 on our list to understand if we have to uh, postpone by a year. Okay. Jerry, you had a comment? Yes. Uh, well, I, for many years, have been a proponent of full-day kindergarten. I do think based on this climate, it would be insensitive to us to move ahead with the referendum. Full day kindergarten is so tied to that referendum that um, you know it's unfortunate that we will not, in my opinion, we would not move ahead on it. But I do think we need to be considerate of all those members in the com community that might be having some kind of financial challenges and to put an undue burden at this time, especially since we really don't know where we're going. We're still in this pandemic. I, for one, agree with this. I think it's a wise and prudent decision on our part as a board. Great, thanks, Jerry. Any other comments from board members? Yes, I have one. I agree with postponing for the same reasons Jerry and everyone else has stated. But with the full day kindergarten, if I remember correctly, there was a large drop in actual registrants. And is there any possibility to not move the program to Mary Kay and keep it where we had originally thought we'd have it at Woodruff, where there might be one or two classrooms if we move some stuff around with the bathrooms that we could move forward with a smaller program with the intentions of moving forward to Mary Kay when we can move forward with the referendum. Um, so uh, I, I think we could ask Melissa to actually look at that. I mean, obviously, you know, this represents a change to what our plan was. As many of you know, we recommended because of the lower enrollment to move that to Mary Kay. So Melissa, I'll just ask you to add that to your list. Uh, and as we look at um, potential impacts, uh, what are other alternatives that you might be able to share? Uh, okay, absolutely. I can take a look at it. Um, yeah, we'll put it on my list. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other comments by board members? Mike? Yes, you know, I agree with everyone's sentiment that um, postponing the referendum, there is a lot of educational needs, looking forward to upgrading the media centers, upgrading the STEM labs, and also some capital improvements on the building infrastructure that are long overdue. But in light of everything going on, I definitely agree postponing it until we can get to a better uh, situa uh, financial situation around everything is definitely the right uh, in agreement with. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I, other... I agree 100. I mean, I, I I just want to emphasize that we're not backing away from this in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, a lot of what's making me think that we should postpone is that it increases the likelihood of success of the referendum. And I think in this environment, we would have no idea whether or not we'd be successful. So, um, so this is really, uh, you know, the 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 idea that drives this towards the more likely successful outcome is to postpone it. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, any other thoughts, uh, anybody wanna add or are we good with those thoughts? Um, if I'm, I, I, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is broad agreement from the board uh, to postpone uh, the referendum. Uh, Mike, I'll ask you and the facilities committee to, uh, to gather, you know, sometime maybe uh, next month and to, uh, think through what are our, our alternatives now that we're going to push off uh, September and look at the 2021 um, options uh, and then uh, repropose a, a new timeline to the board and come back and we can have a discussion. I think Bill's point is very appropriate. Uh, we have not changed uh, the scope of the uh, of the referendum. That's not our intent at all. We still have the same projects that we shared uh, at previous meetings. Uh, anybody who needs more detail on that, it's posted on our website. Uh, and Mike, I'll just ask you and, and the team to come back to us uh, with that. No problem. Okay. Um, before we go on, I want to, uh, uh, to have our student representatives. So Mike, if you can promote our two student representatives, uh, we always like to make sure that our students have a chance to share their experiences, which are unique given uh, they've been 
remote learning for the past six weeks. So if we could bring Alex is on first. Alex, if you can also open up your camera. Oh, great, we can see you now. Yeah. Alex, the floor is yours. All right, um, so due to the current situation, it's been difficult for clubs to operate and activities to take place. So nevertheless, an effort is still being made at GL to keep the GL spirit. Three weeks ago, the student council planned a virtual spirit week where students dressed up and sent pictures of themselves for the newspaper and the yearbook. Monday was pajama day, Tuesday was Highlander Pride Day, Wednesday was pet day, Thursday was hat day, and Friday was formal day. This week, the GL Environmental Club sponsored an Earth Week Haiku Challenge, along with various other challenges. Students, staff, and administration were invited to create haikus that would be voted on for most inspiring, uplifting, resonant, and funniest. In addition, in response to the suspension of the GL play Mamma Mia, the Hilltop players came together and created a short clip of their singing and acting that they posted to social media. <clears throat> Sorry, Alex, what kind of um, interacting are you doing socially in a remote uh, learning world? Are you on Zoom calls with your friends or doing other things interacting remotely? Yeah, yeah, of course. Me and my friends have like late night Zoom calls sometimes, to, like check up on each other, stuff like that. Okay, great, thank you. I see Emily's joined us as well. Emily, thanks for joining. Um, share with us your thoughts about the remote learning world that you're, uh, that you're in now. Oh, do you want me to speak about the sports too or just my thoughts? Oh, sports too is fine, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so with the athletes being home and having lots of time to spare, coaches are doing their best efforts to keep everyone moving and motivated. Many sports, team have, sports teams have created Google Classrooms with daily posts with tips and workouts and film to review to hopefully keep everyone in touch and ready to come back strong. As of now, the season is extended until June 30th, so all are hopeful for a return. In the meantime, the girls across team helped Headstrong Funda Foundation through a virtual 5K and raised almost $2,000. This is a national fundraiser for improving the quality of life for cancer patients who are more susceptible to the virus, and the team is making all efforts to help. Overall, through Zoom and Google Classroom, teams are doing their best and keeping their spirits high while home. And on social accounts, um, I've been keeping up with my friends through Zoom and t a lot of texting. And I've had really good feedback on um, online learning from all my friends, except for one aspect where it's the, um, when you look things up on your iPad, you have the securely that blocks a bunch of stuff. And I know some of the teachers were complaining about it too. But other than that, I think the whole experience has been good. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing and thanks both for, uh, for joining tonight. Uh, any questions for our students besides mine? I have a question for Alex. If we wanted to see the Mamma Mia performances, how would we do that? Um, I, like, I found it on the Instagram. I think it was the GL Hilltop Players Instagram. But it, they don't have the performance. It's kind of like they made like a short clip with everybody singing. Well, that sounds like fun. Thank you. Any other qu uh, questions for Alex or Emily? Alex, is there any way to do the Mamma Mia on a YouTube or something that would be more and more easily accessible? Um, I'm not really sure. I don't really construct the video. All I know that is it's on Instagram, right? It might be on YouTube, but I'm not really sure. I am sure, I am sure Dr. Varley can get a copy of that and share that with board members, some who might not be as uh, Instagram savvy as maybe some of the uh, younger folks. So uh, Dr. Raleigh, I'll leave that one in your hands to uh, uh, share a copy of that, which I'm sure board members would like to see. All right, I will do my best. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thank you uh, again, Alex and, and Emily. We appreciate having you guys uh, on board tonight. Uh, board members, are there any liaison reports to share? I do. A um, couple quick ones. The Environmental Commission, uh, there's a concern about the litter that has been cropping up on our streets. So they're looking to partner with the Berkeley Heights Beautification Committee to organize some kind of a cleanup program for the community. Ed Services working on the challenge of the one-on-one -on -one instruction requirements for some of their uh, 
students with IEPs, but they're being pretty successful with that. And Terry Sopper, the superintendent, has been invited to a meeting sponsored by the Department of uh, Education on best practices. So that's all good signs there working to help our special students as well as our regular ed students. Uh, Union County School Boards is hosting a virtual meeting on April 29th and you can sign up on the NJSBA uh, website if you want to attend that. That's it, thanks. Great, thank you, Helen. Any other liaison reports from board members? Hey, Helen, I got a question. Um, I, I, I keep getting emails about this UCSB um, meeting but it never says what the topic is do you know what it is um i just sent a, an email to patty yesterday i had the same question and i suggested that she add it because that will if it's something we're all interested in would certainly increase uh, participation in the meeting um i'll let you know as soon as they do get that out that's great thanks Great, thanks. Any other liaison reports? Okay, the next item is our uh, citizens hearing. We will have only one citizens hearing tonight. Uh, as, as Mike is promoting some of the other people uh, to our meeting, if you have a comment or a question, if you could use the raise hand functionality uh, on Zoom, and uh, we will see that you have raised your hand, uh, and then we will call on you, we'll unmute you, so you have a chance to ask your question or provide a comment. The first person I see who wants to ask a question is Cheryl. Mike, if you could unmute Cheryl. Uh, if you'd like, we would love to see uh, your video as well, just like if we were sitting in the Columbia cafeteria. It's not a requirement, but we do like to see uh, the people that we're talking to. Um, Cheryl, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Cheryl Harris, um, a resident in Berkeley Heights. Hi, Cheryl. I wanted, hi, I wanted to ask, um, the safety and security training for the full-time staff members was described and the, the timing of it. And I wanted to ask about how that training is done for substitute teachers. Tara, Tara can I have you address that yeah. question? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So all substitute teachers actually um, have access to, it's in essence a Google form where there's videos and details about each of our procedures. And then at the end, they have to do a sign off that they have in fact read um, and understand and it gives them details if they want more information. And then they collaborate with um, whoever in the building is in charge of subs. So for example, at the high school, um, they would work with Jackie Bartlett and also obviously could talk to Rob Nixon or myself to make sure that they are aware of all of our protocols. So they have um, also in every substitute folder district-wide, there's information about drills and what the expectations would be for a substitute as well. So they have a couple of different avenues. They have the training piece as well as, um, you know, a, a, a drill cheat sheet, if you will, of how to follow through if they are in fact in a scenario in the building. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great, thanks for your question, Cheryl. Thank you, Tara. You're welcome. Are there any other members of the public that have a comment or a question for the board? I don't see any other hands being raised. I'll wait another couple of seconds in case you need to find the raise hand functionality. Not seeing anybody else uh, raising their hand. Mike, I'm just confirming, Mike, you don't see anybody else's hands raised? That is correct, sir. Great, thank you. Um, with that, I'll close uh, the citizens hearing uh, for this and we'll move, move on to some of the other items on the agenda. Mr. Reinstein, I'm sorry, it's Tara. May I interrupt for a second? You can. Thank you. So I just wanted to, I'm actually um, the uh, person in charge of clubs and activities at the high school. 
So I just wanted to add a little bit more to what Alex shared. And I know Rob Nixon is in here as well, if he wants to add a little bit more. Um, yeah. We have actually had a lot of our clubs and activities very involved. I think it's a little bit harder for students to see clubs that are beyond where they are um, or beyond what they're involved in because of remote learning. Um, but we've had several different, um, and we've been trying to promote them out via social media. I know Dr. Varley's put some in her newsletter. Mr. Nixon has repeatedly put them in his, um, you know, parent communications. But um, our clubs and activities are very much active and involved. And I want to make sure that, um, you know, we're aware because our advisors are working very hard. Uh, you know, the bagpipers did a, a moment together across the country. We've had the photo contest. Student ambassadors are reaching out to uh, students and doing an asked and answered every week. Uh, Interact, you had mentioned and highlighted earlier. I don't necessarily need to go on and on, but I do just want to make sure that it is noted that they are definitely very active right now. Um, sure. hey, hey, Tara, and, and, and to jump in a little bit, I mean, we, we had our environmental club was highly engaged all throughout this week as, you know, Earth Day and Earth Week was celebrated right down to planting a, uh, a, a new tree out in front of the high school, a sugar time flowering crab was planted, or uh, Mrs. Hodge with her foundations of studio art class, they competed, uh, completed a recycling uh, container art project, which was really cool. This will all be part of the, the parent email that goes home this week. Uh, our model UN uh, also did a great job uh, taking part in a two hour, two hour mini crisis conference on a topic of Silicon Valley. They did that this past Friday. And all throughout this week, our Italian and Spanish clubs have uh, taken part in a Proud of Your Heritage Week, where they helped, um, you know, promote different cultures, uh, you know, that maybe not all families are familiar with. So our clubs and activities have certainly been very active. And I think that's one of the things I've been most proud of is as, as we go through remote learning, it's not so much how do we move our curriculum forward remotely, how do we move forward everything we do as a school community when and as as we move on we're starting to incorporate clubs and activities more uh, our athletics are certainly involved in um you know as a principal of school i just want to you know commend everybody for the great work that they've done um you know trying to incorporate all aspects of our uh of our educational program yeah and, and as we're looking at our seniors and making sure that they are still trying to have some uh, some normalcy, if possible. I know that our school newspaper is also doing uh, features on our seniors on Instagram. So we can try and push that out as well so that more people can see these items. So thank you for letting us jump in. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay, Tara. Rob, thank you very, very much. It's helpful. You know, I think that's, that's a question on some people's minds. How, uh, how are we doing the other school activities uh, when we're doing remote? With that in mind, I'm Frank Geiger, I see that you're on. Can I ask you to come off of mute and maybe uh, share a minute or a two worth of what the Columbia Middle School group is doing in the same regard of how are they you know, doing things for the non-school pieces? Uh, what are they doing as well, Frank? Maybe a sure. minute or two of uh, thoughts from uh, CMS. Sure, we had um, originally, when we first left the building, if you will, we had, um, all our clubs, everything was in full swing. Obviously, we were looking forward to spring sports, um, and a lot of that was just paused for a moment. For a moment, but our clubs are operating just as you would, you know, just as you heard from the high school. And we're actually asking uh, club um, advisors to provide, um, you know, some documentation. So they're taking screenshots, they're sharing um, videos with me and Mrs. Acosta. And we're trying to give uh, Mr. Scour a few of those um, shots to, to, to uh, share online. But um, I know from speaking to some students that they are still participating in those clubs. We are making arrangements. There, there's a few things that are um, milestones in the building, such as I'm sure you're well aware of the annual um, mural that we put in the building. And, you know, Mr. Lonnie is still working with the art club with every expectation that eventually we will have that mural up, whether it's just a big mask on the wall. I don't know what it's going to be. It's, it's always designed by the students. But um, so those those things are going on. And um, we have a couple of things that normally start in the spring that we won't be we won't be starting um, until we you know have a sense that we might be getting back into the building because they're more physical in nature such as the running club and um, our golf club. And that would be very hard to you know, manage, I think, online, especially since a lot of the students who join our golf club in the spring don't have the equipment. They're just gonna, you know, they wanna try it out. So um, we're doing you know, 
everything as far as those clubs go, we're doing that very well. You mentioned that um, uh, Mr. Ziobro was using our um, 3D printers, but what, what I think I wanted to share most of all was we had a call by the math teachers this past week um, because the kids were, were getting toward the end of their journal, which typically this time of the year, it's a, it's a disposable journal that the students um, you know, do their math work in. And uh, between Mrs. Sheehan and the custodians, it was coordinated. And we had a couple of bus routes this week that went from house to house to house. We asked parents to put a chair in the driveway so we wouldn't have to look for house numbers. And if you had a chair in the driveway, by accident, um, if, if Mr. Reinstein, if you left your chair in the driveway, you would have ended up with a math book this week. But um, so we were just, uh, we went around town this week and distributed the math books. And um, so, you know, it's all hands on deck and I think everybody's doing a great job, really. Great, great, Frank, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, and I'll make sure not to leave a chair in my driveway <laughs> anytime in the near future. No, we're done, we're done with that, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, good to see they let you out of the garage, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I've got more than one room in my house. <laughs> I do have a quick um, question. For okay, Frank. Uh, Rob, okay. Rob, Tara, and, Fr and Frank, thank you very much for sharing. I think it's it's always helpful just to hear more about sure. what's going on. I think I heard someone say they had a question. Of course, thank you. Yeah, I, I did have a quick question, Frank. Um, um, back a couple meetings ago, we had that very excellent presentation on the enhancement to the outside garden it was all part of with the environmental commission or anything right. in light of everything going on i mean have they came up with a plan b be able to work on it this fall anything no i'm, I'm really concerned that um there's a couple of concerns mostly that all those kids are in eighth grade and they're all concentrating on, on other things the only the only um bright light i would i would put on that subject right now is that um, this began in Mr. Clayton's um, science program, and um, I think he would want to, you know, carry that forward. So I think we might be on a pause for a year, but we know that that um, courtyard is uh, in dire need, and we want to make that a robust space, especially in light of what we're facing. We don't know what we're going to look at next year, but that would be an excellent place to have an out, you know, to to augment our seating for the cafeteria to spread kids out a little bit more and also to provide an outdoor classroom um, for perhaps um, you know open mic sessions where we can spread kids out and things like that so an alternate club space if you will as well so we want to make sure that, that that's happening but right now uh, that is on pause uh, figured as much but if you could keep that on the on the uh, on the list that way we could look at it again uh, oh abs absolutely absolutely Great, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, to all three of our uh, administrators. Uh, moving on, administration, can I get a motion for administration items? If all board members can go off of mute as we'll now be voting on the agenda items. Yeah, I'll move administration item 13A. Second. Motion is second, any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Tenna? Yes. Mr. Dequila? Yes. Mr. Joya? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Cassano? Yes. Dr. Christina? Yes. Mrs. Kirsch? Yes. Mr. Reinstein? Yes. Personnel? I'll move personnel 14A through L. Second. Motion a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Penna? Yes. Mr. Dequila? Yes. Mr. Joya? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Cassano? Yes. Dr. Christinino? Yes. Mrs. Kirsch? Yes. Mr. Reinstein? Yes. Uh, moving to item 15, business. Okay, I move business um, items A through C. Second. Uh, motion and second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Penna? Yes. Mr. Dequila? Yes. Mr. Joya? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Cassano? Yes. Dr. Christina? Yes. Mrs. Kirsch? 
Mr. Reinstein. Yes, item 16, finance. I'll move items A through C. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Penna? Yes. Mr. Dequila? Yes. Mr. Joya? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Cassano? Yes. Dr. Cristinino? Yes. Mrs. Kirsch? Yes. Mr. Reinstein? Yes. Is there any other business to come before the board? I will just make one comment that our next meeting is on May, I think it's May 7th, is our, is our next meeting that Thursday night, uh, yes, May 7th. Uh, we are going to celebrating our educators of the year. So we're going to come up with a creative way to honor our educators uh, remotely, since we'll still be on a remote um, setting. Uh, thank you. Uh, for everybody who joined um, tonight, uh, looks like we had about 50 or so somewhat people uh, who joined the meeting. So thank you to those who attend. Uh, Mike Scar, thank you for uh, for hosting us tonight. Board members, thank you again. Uh, be well and stay safe, and we'll see you again at our May 7th. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.